Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Wherever you are in the world today, welcome to this, our third day of our Global Security Perspective Symposium. My name is Curtis Busby Earl, and I am a Senior Lecturer of Computer Science in the Department of Computing at the University of the West Indies at Mona here in Jamaica. Welcome. And I'm so pleased that you could join us this morning and you can join us today, uh, especially because we know that your time is valuable and that you've chosen to spend some of your valuable time with us to hear and to talk about some aspects of science and in particular, some aspects on global security. Yesterday, we had a number of of very interesting and thought-provoking discussions and presentations. Our participants yesterday and speakers were Dr. Nia Tuka from Kenya, Dr. Goodridge from our sister campus in Trinidad, Professor Morris from the University of Leeds in the UK, and Dr. Curtis Charles from our sister campus at the Five Islands in Antigua. Today, we will have another list of very interesting, very thought-provoking presentations. And they come to us from our participants who will be joining us from South Africa. And that will be Dr. Ogundani. We also have Dr. Frederick Pessel from the University of Leeds in the UK. And from the same institution, we have Dr. Omar Huerta. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to hearing the presentations. Welcome again. And let me start by introducing our first speaker, and that is Dr. Ogundani from the University of South Africa. And he will tell us a bit about his interests and his concerns with regard to global security in the area of leadership in digital health and security. Dr. Ogundani, welcome. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, Curtis. And I'm happy to be here today. So firstly, I would like to thank the organizers of this event, uh, the University of the West Indies. I would like to thank uh, the team behind the scenes. Uh, you guys have been doing an amazing job over the past two days. So uh, moving on, my name is Uluwamayawa uh, Ogundaini, and uh, I'm currently I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of South Africa, the Graduate School of Business Leadership. And today I will be speaking on a topic that touches on the human, national, and transnational perspective on security, which is the the health security, particularly. Uh, digital driven health security. And I'll be looking at the leadership aspect. Uh, in terms of my interests, my research interests, I am interested in health informatics, everything that has to do with e-health or digital health design and applications. And obviously, anything that has to do with transformation, moving from the current situation to the desired situation. And by way of introduction, I will be speaking through the concepts of digital health, health security, leadership within health security, and then I would contextualize it within the African context. And as a conclusion, I'll be looking at the opportunities moving forward beyond the sustainable development goals uh, that would be elapsed in 2030. So in terms of what digital health is, your digital health has been, uh, it has been, it has involved, it has evolved over the years uh, from the time it was the, the term e-health 
was conceptualized by Eisenberg in 2001 to the definition of the WHO, uh, digital global strategy on digital health between 2020 and 2025, where digital health was conceptualized as the field that is associated with the development, the design and the use of digital health technologies as a way to improve diagnosis, treatment, rehabilitation, and particularly the person-centered overall well-being. And the motivation behind this is to drive and shape safe, equitable, and universal access to quality healthcare service. And in terms of universal access, we're talking proximity, we're talking affordability, and most importantly, availability of healthcare services when uh, clients or customers need to access health services. And also, when you look at the six pillars of health system strengthening by as proposed by the WHO, service delivery, health workforce, health information systems, access to essential medicine, vaccines, technology, financing, and lastly, leadership and governance. Two of the concepts within my topic today, which is leadership and technology, are key areas within those six pillars. And the idea of those six pillars which is to strengthen the health system, is to improve well-being and equity for all. In terms of what uh, digital health entails, it ranges from how we use mobile technology, how we use uh, your desktop computers, how we use tablets, at the palm of our hands, especially healthcare professionals, uh, community health workers, specialists within the health field, not only to record patient history, but also to store and receive laboratory test results, uh, to monitor the progress of patients during their rehabilitation process. And what these technologies do is that it enables convenience, it enables safety, where the data of patients can be kept secure. Moving on from digital health to health security. Health security in itself has to do with reducing the vulnerability and risks of different societies around the globe to health threats that can spread easily across national borders. A perfect example was the COVID-19 that emerged between December 2019 and March 2020. And that caused global lockdowns, it caused, uh, you know, the economy, the global economy to essentially be at a pause. Life came to a standstill. And something, one thing that was proven to the world that the health systems across the world are not ready to deal with public health crisis on a global scale, meaning that we need to do better in terms of securing our health. Health security and resilience of health systems are very, very intertwined because its health system resilience has to do with preparing, responding, and adapting accordingly. In terms of preparing, preparation has to do with either preventing or detecting imminent disease outbreaks. Those disease outbreaks could either be communicable diseases or non-communicable diseases. In terms of response, it is essential to be prepared 
to deploy resources equitably to collect, to collect relevant data, to trace, treat, and make sure that the out, outbreaks are contained. And in terms of adaptation, it is essential that healthcare services adjust their operations in order to stabilize the health system and not compromise on acceptable standards of services. And you will find that the factors that affect health security mostly are health systems. And these health systems has to do with all that encompasses the delivery of healthcare services, the healthcare providers, the professionals, the access to vaccines, the resources. In terms of enabling environment, the there has to be sufficient resources, infrastructures, investments, human capacity to ensure that the health system is well prepared to respond and adapt in the event of global health crisis. And of course, there's the issue of ethics, ensuring that the healthcare practice operates within ethical standards, the data that is being collected are not being used mischievously by third party individuals or organizations. And lastly, there's the equity, diversity and inclusion considerations, which speaks to inequalities. As a scholar said in 2021, by the name of Richard X, he coined the term of adverse digital incorporation, which refers to inclusion in a digital system that enables a more advantaged group to extract disproportionate value from the work or resources of another or less advantaged group. This is in a bid to encourage the, the closing of the digital divide. But beyond closing the digital divide, there, there, is a, there is a new phenomenon whereby people of more advantaged group, perhaps in the urban area, are able to have more resources and they benefit more than others. Now, if we look at the sustainable development goals, the Goal number three speaks to good health and well-being. For the globe to have good health and well-being, there needs to be investment in health security. And by extension, there needs to be investment in how health systems become resilient. That is how they plan, prepare, and adapt to public health crisis. And we, 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 without the good health and well-being, if, if we look at the first two uh, sustainable development goals, which is no poverty, zero hunger, these two are largely hinged on ensuring that human beings around the world have good health and well-being. Now, when we talk about digital driven health security, which is looking at the intersection between digital health and health security, we can summarily define that as any use of information and communication technologies to mitigate the vulnerabilities and risks of society to health threats. So in, so what, in a sense, what we're saying is the use of mobile phones, tablets, wearable sensors to monitor self-management and rehabilitation services, telemedicine, where healthcare services is facilitated remotely between healthcare professionals and patients, use of technology to guarantee equitable access in terms of 
proximity, in terms of availability, and in terms of affordability of healthcare services. And of course, the enhanced use of data aggregation, ag aggregation and reporting technologies. Because if we look at the fourth industrial revolution, it is largely dependent on the use of data. Data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence, use of different sets of data, big data, to make, to detect, to prevent, to prescribe, to prevent, uh, and even to predict the, the patterns, the trends in which diseases can spread and how it should be curbed. So I'll talk about leadership in digital health. Uh, leader, why dig, leadership in digital health? That is because if you look at the six building blocks of the WHO's health training framework, technology and leadership are two of those building blocks. And leadership is essential in order to mitigate the negative effects of ineffective management of resources and poor governance that result in suboptimal healthcare service delivery. So leadership essentially in digital health has to be at the forefront of ideating solutions to solve problems, creating an enabling environment where these solutions are able to work and produce the desired output. And leaders should be able to make informed decisions to drive change. Um, unfortunately, in terms of digital health leadership in the African health system, it is neither conceptualized or neither entrenched in how these health systems okay, can lead to health security. And I'm going to discuss this uh, lack of leadership being defined much later um, when much later on in the slides. In terms of leadership in, in, in the health systems, it can be divided into two main categories. There is the political leadership and there is the technical leadership. In terms of political leadership, it has to do with the governance structure, decision-making structure at the highest level of a country. Speaking about the Ministry of Health, uh, the, the, the provincial, health departments, the different sub health departments and that decision making body, which involves the personnel that are willing to commit, invest and ensure that there's adequate health infrastructure, there's available human resources and there's quality service delivery which is accessible to all citizens again accessibility in terms of proximity in terms of availability and in terms of affordability the converse of not having a, a, a good political leadership is corrupt leadership that leads to mismanagement of resources ineffective policies that do not prioritize the competencies that are needed to strengthen healthcare, uh, healthcare services and the health system as a whole. In terms of technical leadership, this refers to the personnel, the workforce that have the competencies and skills to translate knowledge into practice. And this technical leadership is based on the academic qualification and the professional experience. The competencies required for technical leadership, they include managerial, digital skills, interprofessional collaborations, regulatory accountabilities, and technology-enabled decision 
making. So if we look at leadership within the digital driven health security, it has to, it, it, it needs to be made up of attributes of political leadership and technical leadership to the point where we can conceptualize leadership in digital health as the acts of a competent individual with relevant ICT and digital skills and the knowledge in taking the lead to implement and evaluate technology-driven solutions. The leader must be able to operationalize plans within a multidisciplinary stakeholder team, establish mentorship, share knowledge, institute accountability. Very, very important when it comes to allocation of resources. And these leaders or leader must be able to motivate people, the personnel within the workforce to address health-related challenges, especially that are peculiar to a certain context. Um, in terms of the how leadership within the, the WHO system uh, system strengthening framework uh, has influenced digital health in Africa. Uh, there is a recent study by Kamaragi et al. where they looked at the use of digital health interventions in sub-Saharan Africa. And at the, at the moment, the authors identified over 900 digital health tools. And out of those 983 or more digital health tools, they analyzed about 738 of those digital school, uh, digital tools. And as uh, you can see on my screen, the spatial distribution of those digital tools, uh, you would see there are countries where there's a plethora of digital tools that have been developed, implemented, and are being used. Some of these tools are duplicates, but most importantly, a large portion of those tools are more focused on data collection, data mining, as opposed to the actual provision and improvement of access to healthcare services. Now, when we look at those digital health interventions in relation to the six building blocks of uh, WHO, you find out that leadership and governance has the least impacts or the least intervention out of these six building blocks. And this is one of the reasons why there, there is a need to look at how digital health interventions are designed what form of leadership and experience is needed to ensure that when these digital health interventions are conceptualized and being designed, there is a, an equitable spread and also the, the underlying value, the underlying motivation of ensuring health security, planning, uh, adapting, responding to public health crisis, all these things have to, have to come together to ensure that equitable health access for all is delivered. One of the ways in which the different countries, especially in Africa, who are signatory to the WHO global uh, strategy. One of the ways in which they have operationalized that strategy is to develop national e-health or digital strategies. Some call it uh, frameworks, others call it policies. 
uh, you find out that there's an impressive 41 out of 54 countries on the African continent who have these national e-health or digital health strategies. However, when it comes to leadership and governance, only about 13 of them, which I've marked on that image, okay, have made provisions for e-health leadership, e-health leadership capacity building, or even e-health leadership competencies. And the extent to which these provisions have been operationalized is not yet known, meaning the degree to which this parts, the leadership aspect of a national e-health or digital health strategy has been operationalized to ensure that health security is achieved is unknown. So there is some opportunities there for further research in future. Some have argued that one of the reasons or yeah, two of the reasons why there is a a stagnation in how countries implement their digital health strategies is due to some form of lack of inadequacies in either resources or capabilities or both where resources and capabilities are lacking. When we look at the health systems in Africa, okay, the health systems are overburdened. They are overburdened with re-emerging disease epidemics. So for example, over the past two to three years, there has been a break of Ebola in the Central Africa. There has been a break of Lassa fever. Just about last month or so, there was a flood in Malawi and there was a cholera outbreak. So there's always re-emerging disease epidemics within the continent. There's a death of infrastructure. There is not enough investment in how health infrastructures are, are being developed. There's limited human resources. So the ratio of healthcare professionals to patients is very low. This is coupled with the fact that there is an exodus, a brain drain of professionals moving to countries where there's access to the resources needed to provide services. There's poor reporting and data management, lack of adequate funding. There's the issue of exclusion of vulnerable and minority groups. And one of the most uh, unfortunate, which is the regional political conflicts. Just on Sunday, conflict broke out in Sudan. And I was just watching the news just before this presentation, and the majority of the health care facilities have been shut down. They've also been involved in terms of how the conflict has damaged those infrastructures. So these are some of the issues which I, which I call wicked problems, problems that have refused to go, problems that have refused to 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 have solutions to, or they keep re-emerging. And these are the issues that affect health security on the, at the, bigger, on the bigger picture. So we might want to look at why digital health, why leadership in digital health security. When you look at distribution of digital health interventions as targeted towards health system challenges, leadership and governance is the least uh, in terms of the health system strengthening building blocks. There, there needs to be some form of intervention within that particular building block. And this, is, this, this lecture of mine today is a, form of, uh, a call to action, an agenda for research collaboration where academics around the world can start looking at the types of leadership, the attributes of leadership, competencies of leadership and governance that is needed to support strengthening health systems within Africa.
All is not doom and gloom when it comes to the African continent. I've mentioned the issues which we are grappling with. However, there are digital health initiatives. Some are global-led, some are national or in-country-led, and some are private-led. Okay, for example, there's the UNICEF in collaboration with the Ministry of Health in Zambia, which use mobile technology for early detection and diagnosis of HIV in newborn babies. There's the Mom Connect and Nurse Connect used in South Africa, where nursing mothers can send SMSs and get information about antenatal care. In Kenya, there is an e-health unit that has been established to look at policy issues and also to monitor national projects. And there are also examples of digital health startups, okay, which have become which have become very uh, ubiquitous around Sub-Saharan Africa. Examples include MTBA in Kenya. Uh, there's the use of drones, especially in in conflict areas where there are political instability. Drones to transport and supply medical supplies. There's uh, diabetes monitoring applications. There's Elo Doctor. So these are some of the digital health initiatives that can be used in terms of ensuring that we have health security, we have strengthened health systems such that uh, the, the, the risks and vulnerabilities are limited to the barest minimum. In terms of challenges with digital health security, there's the issue of funding, very similar to the challenges of health health systems. Digital health itself has issues of funding, regulation. For example, in recent times, there's been the talk of use of AI, but the AI space is largely unregulated, meaning that data can be used for misinformation and disinformation, and this defeats the purpose of health security. Energy supply. Uh, around the world, especially in Africa, we seems to still be in the second industrial revolution where we are not able to match the demand of electricity to the supply of electricity. There's this adverse digital incorporation as I earlier touched on, policy implementation still an issue and political leadership. These are all the challenges that influence digital health leadership in one form or the other. The takeaway from this lecture is that there are at least 900 digital health tools. There could be more, but according to literature, at least that are being used. And based on the data from literature, from the e-health strategies, it is instructive that policymakers in sub-Saharan Africa need to urgently institute coordination mechanisms to manage duplication and encourage implementations to scale of these digital health interventions. Digital health leadership in countries within Sub-Saharan Africa is clearly lacking. There's a need for investments in areas with shortcomings and promotion of multi-purpose solutions and additional efforts needed in dissemination, dissemination of digital health implementation and outcomes. So for example, when you look at the scorecard of the sustainable development goals africa is the least performing not because aside from the challenges i've mentioned there's also the issue of poor reporting which largely affects how the the outlook of the sustainable development goals scorecard what are the opportunities for leadership in digital health security now and beyond 2030? Um, there is a need to develop leadership courses specific to digital health, which can help to build capacity and create a digitally capable health workforce. There's a need for collaborations for co-learning to improve coordination. So collaborations between global north and the global south so that lessons can be learned and 
the, the context and what is required can be implemented where necessary. Transdisciplinary and engaged scholarship research, where academics and researchers actually go to the field and co-create knowledge with stakeholders and also the need to decolonize methodologies to design digital health solutions for local contexts and promotion for community-led participation. These are some of the opportunities that, are, that should be looked into now and beyond the expiry of the sustainable development goals in 2030. Thank you to the audience for taking out time to listen to my turn today. Um, I think there is room to have more discussions at, um, at the end of the program. Uh, my email is, is available on requests and please reach out and let's see how we can collaborate together. Here are some of the references I used and thank you so much once again for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Obendani. Very informative presentation, lots of useful information and many questions have been raised, certainly on, on my end. So looking forward to the, uh, after the last speaker, when we can ask at least one or two questions uh, of you. Next on our list of presenters is Dr. Frederick Pesu. And Dr. Pesu comes to us today from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. And his area is in nuclear sciences and energy. And so we are <clears throat> also quite interested to hear of his perspectives on global security in this area. And so I would like to welcome Dr. Pesu and invite him to take the floor and make his presentation for us today. Dr. Pesu. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Curtis, for the introduction. And thank you for everyone attending today. Thank you for the organizers as well for having me. Such a privilege to be able to uh, share my perspective uh, from an energy uh, uh, context. Uh, so today I'll be speaking on what I've tagged, uh, energy security, the challenge of balancing global energy demand, climate moderation, and material resource optimization. And it's it's uh, it takes its roots sort of from my area of core expertise but then i try to i would try to broaden its uh, its relevance within the social context as well so that we can see how it's connected to different things up and around the world as related to global security not just within a section of the society but across the whole uh, the whole world uh just before i dive into the the, the content for today's talk uh, my research is really more about material sustainability and material resilience, how you uh, build material resilience to deliver energy or energy application, and it cuts across different forms of energy systems, uh, whether it's the uh, oil and gas of the 1950s and 1960s and 70s and down now to renewable energy systems that include geothermal, uh, uh, solar, and nuclear. So you can see in the course of the talk today, the interconnection between all the energy systems within which my research applies. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of the global uh, security perspective, the, 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 the discussion we have in, in this uh, symposium, so you will see how it's more related to environmental, which has to do with food, climate, with energy and resources. So try to tie everything together and bring some social context to it. So um, the first question I try to really answer is energy security. Uh, it's very, it's always very easy to kind of narrow it down to energy, but of course we are looking at it from a global perspective. So you have to try to connect the different side to it, whether it's a social science side to it, human behavior, trends and everything. But what, the way I would like to define this is that it has three strands to it, energy security. One of them is energy resources. And resources are everywhere. Uh, for so many years, we've been oblivious to some part of it because uh, maybe we do not have the technology to unnest them. 
And this brings to the second part of energy security, which is having uninterrupted access to energy. So the first one is resources, where geopolitics or strength of the economics might really determine how you unnest that or how you're able to identify these resources. The other one is, the next one is then how you're able to deploy the strength of your economics, uh, the economy and the, 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 your, maybe your geopolitical strength and leverages to kind of unnest it and gain access to these uh, energy resources. And that would mean developing very high efficient uh, energy production systems. And then the next part of it would, uh, would be securing the energy at an affordable price. All of these, if you think about it carefully, is all, it all have uh, link uh, influence globally. So having affordable energy uh, for, need, for use is, is something everyone needs, whether you're in the global north or the global south. And for us to be able to now get to the point of having um, uh, affordable energy uh, prices, right? That means everyone can afford it. It doesn't matter whether you are living in, in the UK or Canada or US or you're in Bangladesh or in Somali. Whichever way you're able to afford it, now depends on how much we've been able to explore R&D capabilities to optimize the system and get more out of it with less investment into it. And, and all of these... Uh, three three strands of what I've defined energy security to really uh, encompass can be linked to the the, the 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 pressures of rising incomes in emerging economies. So you have the BRICS nations, South Africa, Russia, and um, India and, and Indonesia, all Brazil coming into a new what I would call middle class of emerging economics, economies, and then you have the population explosion that would expect to be up to 9 billion in, by 2040. That would put pressure, of course. And we also have the, the shift in consumer preference and technological advancement, our needs. We have we now have an insatiable appetite for energy, right? We want everything to be all within our reach quickly. And, and we don't have patience anymore. We, when we search things, we want to get it. We're going to get the information we, we're looking for. So all of these is kind of influencing how the energy uh, mix or energy the energy sources we're kind of li- leveraging on uh, emerges or, or what we depend on. So now we, to be able to meet that and balance, of course, climate change and meet uh, and retain. Uh, these three strands, what I call energy security, then we have to now explore new uh, new forms of energy, new technology to unless different form, form of energy that we've been oblivious to uh, in previous decades. And of course, the last bit, which is always the unfortunate case, is the geopolitics involved with it, the wars, the narrow-minded economic interests that we have, usually relates to the division between the global north and south and how, you know, the narrow-minded economic interests really... Uh, have to influence their their policies, uh, with, whether at home or abroad. Now, having said all of this, uh, from my perspective, as uh, someone that teaches both uh, thermodynamics, which has to do with energy and material science, everything else we've discussed about the emerging economies, about advancement in technology, about our energy need, being able to access energy, or even the resources that we have to, to, to unnest it, and to optimize it all depends on how much material resources we have to be able to deliver it. And how sustainable is that? Because uh, material is very, very uh, important most times, but it's usually not discussed in the context of energy security. But that is where my own personal research interest really uh, uh, comes comes in. So this is kind of the, the way I would introduce energy security uh, in this talk. Um, just to give a bit of uh, context, I know I've talked about in the previous slide about the changing uh, energy mix because of the needs, right? So there's different ways you're using fracking to get some uh, more natural gas or even uh, geothermal heat to power our homes with heat pumps and everything. But these were not there in 1950s or 1940s because then we all depended on oil and gas. But before oil and gas, we had... Um, uh, coal. Okay, so you can see the chart. This is the chart by BP to show in the evolution 
of the energy uh, resources that the world has depended on over the years. From 1900s, we have coal, and the 1960s, 50s, and 40s, and 70s, we have oil. But slowly, if you look at it on the blue line, you see how uh, the renewable energy, uh, the, the orange line, renewable energy is increasing, but also is a non-fossil non fuel, right? This is where nuclear comes into play. So from 2020 onwards, now you start to see renewable energy uh, 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 increasing its uh, the deployment in the world. And now there's, there's going to be a lot of consequences in terms of what we define as energy security, right? So before now, we would say, uh, for example, uh, Denmark used to produce uh, a lot of their energy from you know, fossil fuel and all of that. Then in 2021, the amount of energy produced in 2021, 50% of that is from wind, right? And only 3.7% is from oil. In the same uh, period, which we're all talking about decarbonization at the moment, uh, the UK is planning to increase its nuclear electricity by fourfold, by 2050. So you can see the energy mix is changing. It has consequences. What some, some of those consequences will really I felt what in, a, in a, you know we link to uh, uh, the, the the global uh, energy politics if if I call it that way. So there's going to be a, a seismic shift in energy geopolitics. So before now, OPEC used and its cartel used to have a leverage in terms of pricing and all of that because the whole world depend on oil on OPEC uh, OPEC countries to deliver oil, right? And now. Uh, and most of those countries that depend on the OPEC nations are in the global north, right? But then the global south used to be most of which have the result, which is the resources, the, the oil and gas. And now the the whole geopolitics is a bit shifting because the technology to harness these uh, uh, non-fossil fuels or other renewable energy is still in the hands of the global north. So OPEC will be on a plain defense uh, in trying to get that leverage. And that would affect how uh, geopolitics is played, uh, the energy war that we see today in, with, the, with the crisis in Ukraine and Russia. And in 20, 2008, we know how the, the gas to Georgia was turned off, the tap was turned off. And, you know, and then with these technology to unnest these new forms of energy uh, being in the hands of the global north, then there will be need for new materials, right? New metals, new ores, new things, lithium, for instance, for the batteries to store energy from renewable uh, sources in the global north, in, in, in the west, and in the, in the most powerful nations in the world. So this is some of the consequences of this changing energy mix and decarbonization. Okay, so in this one slide, and all I've tried to make, you can see the, 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 the balancing act between the resources and the technology to have access to these resources, the energy resources. So this is uh, what some of the uh, consequences you would, you would find. And so this is uh, uh, just to give an idea uh, about the whole global energy transition strategy that has been pushed. There's a buzzword around uh, at the moment. Energy transition, of course, is a good thing, but it, it tends to highlight where uh, the preference or the pace from the perspective of the uh, the, the global north, I, 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 you hear me make a reference to that every now and then, the global north and the global south. Now, you would imagine that if, but if we've not had the technology developed to unnest the renewable or alternative form of energy, then the pace of energy transition would not be fast tracked, right? But as soon as the technology is being unnessed and developed in the global north, then the change the change in the pace will what would increase, and that's what we expect with, uh, with what this uh, chart is showing. So you can see how quickly the uh, energy mix would change with a fast, uh, with faster transition from uh, renewable to, I mean, uh, oil and gas and fossil fuel to renewable energy sources. So if you look at the chart carefully, you can see. Um, uh, the green, the green part of the chart, you see, uh, in 2016, you have only 4% as renewable energy in 20, uh, 2040 with a steady uh, evolving energy transition from 4%, you're going to get to 14%. And then if you go to each energy transition, you're going to get up to 33% 33 of the energy mix globally from renewable energy sources. And that'll be renewable, that'll be solar, wind, tidal, and the rest. 
But of course, this, the pace of this will be determined by the available technology to harness these resources because these resources have been there from, from God knows how long. But most interestingly, you can also see that even the nuclear part, the nuclear energy, energy contribution is also increasing from 4% in 2016, potentially to about 8% in 2040 for a very faster uh, uh, energy transition. Now, again, the technology to unnest the resources in this energy contest is one-sided, but mostly you will see in the next couple of slides that most of the resources are predominantly dominated in a different section of, 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 the, of the world. Right, and the, the part that owns the resources that has majority of the resources doesn't have the technology, and I think this is where it is linked to uh, this idea of what energy security really means. Is it energy security for just a section of the global society, or energy security for everyone? It has to be for everyone because we are looking at it from the point of view of available resources, availability of technology to assess the energy and the price for all. So in the context of energy security or global energy security, then we have to think about it for everyone, being able to have access to both the resources, um, uh, the, the technology, and also uh, uh, the, the affordability. But yeah, this is when geopolitics comes in, leverage, economic leverage, the strength of your economy comes into play and you start to play, you know, uh, the cat and mouse with these uh, with these things, and then then you continue to have the global north and the global south. So this is what. So there's a lot more woven into this slide uh, shown uh, on these uh, uh, here. And so this is the. So I'm going to speak in the context of the areas where I have my research aligned to. So which is solar and nuclear for the of this talk. Of course, the other part of my research is linked to geothermal and oil and gas, but I'll focus on this because if you look at these, uh, this map, it shows the distribution of the direct solar radiation globally, and you can see where every nation of the world really lies in terms of how much uh, solar thermal energy resources we have. So you can see, apart from the, United, the southern part of the United States and maybe Australia, uh, every other part of the world where you have a huge amount of sun, you couldn't, you wouldn't tag them as part of the global north. They are all part of the global south. Okay, and the potential is so huge. If you look at it, so it says it has between uh, 1.5 uh, to 50k exajoules of available energy globally, but yet the amount of energy uh, supply to the world from the current energy then in 2014 was just 557 exajoules. And so the available resources from just the solar thermal radiation alone globally is equivalent to 14 billion uh, tons of oil. And that is the potential uh, energy resources available put across the world, irrespective of whether you're in the global north or the global south. Okay, in the next couple of slides, you would now see where it's kind of disconnected from accessibility to these uh, energy resources. Um, so the so just to kind of link back to uh, the previous slide is what I've typed the geopolitical implication of solar power for the global south. So if you look at the previous slide, uh, I can go back to it. Um, uh, you will see that majority uh, of the, the direct solar thermal energy resources is in the global south. But then if you go if you go to these, you will see the headlines like cannot Africa, which is part of where you have uh, most of the direct solar radiation, uh, which is north of the Sahara Desert. You can see headlines like, cannot Africa light up Europe with solar power? Uh, the other one says, sub-Sahara Africa is still in dark, but not Africa uh, will soon be selling power to Europe. And then you have the colossal African solar farm that could power Europe. So you can see the direction so even if we have the resources in Africa, for instance, if it's a case in study, the northern part of Africa where you have Tunisia, uh, Algeria, Egypt, and Morocco, what the investment or the the, the 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 technology coming into those part of the country, to the part of the continent, is actually not to make energy accessible to the, to the continent, or even at an affordable price, but it's to make energy from the resources in, the, in, in that part of the continent available to, the, to Europe. 
So part of the plan is this uh, uh, chart I've shown on the top right corner, which shows the three different routes with which energy from the from the solar uh, the, the solar power in the northern part of Africa is to be channeled to, to power Europe. So there is one that is Tunisia France route or the Tunisia Italy route or the Tunisia uh, Malta route to Europe. So the idea is you have a lot of investment from Europe with your technology into Africa, the northern part of Africa, where you have this high amount of solar direct solar radiation to take the electricity and power Europe. And ironically, uh, just you have the, the biggest uh, solar complex in Morocco, uh, which is called the Gateway to the Sahara. It has a lot of investment. But just beside you, uh, uh, North Africa, where you have all this investment in Tunisia, in Egypt, in billions of dollars of European money and technology, you also have the Horn of Africa, where you have food, food uh, security issues, and you have probably farming, you know, water, drought, and all those things. So for me, uh, as a scientist sitting here, I'm thinking, can we not use, you will see in the next couple of slides that with such solar power uh, resources, we can actually power water desalination infrastructure in North Africa and also in the Horn of Africa to really cater for the, to solve the food security problems in the Horn of Africa, which is, it's not more like a perennial problem. Uh, in that region. And this is where accessibility to the energy resources that is very, you know, domicile in the continent is not, is, is, uh, is, is missing because the technology to do that is not in their hands. And sometimes accessibility to this technology is driven by geopolitics and influence and, you know, uh, government policy or uh, narrow-minded uh, economic interests, okay? And of course, there are going to be other aspects to it, but this is just one uh, part of it that talks about the the resources, the balance in the resources, and the accessibility to the energy uh, resources. Okay, and so this is what the technology really is to, for to be able to get solar um, uh, energy from the direct solar thermal irradiation from the sun. Okay, so the most common one we see is the photovoltaic cells, which is very common. The solar panels connects it, it converts electricity directly from the sun, but we also have the the one that is of interest to me and which is used on it at an industrial scale, and that has to do with concentrated solar power plants. You also have that in South Africa as well, any part of the world, and also in Chile where you have high direct solar irradiation. So what this does is you have a couple of heliostats, like mirrors, and they concentrate the heat from the sun, and its power is concentrated to a receiver that have a heating fluid that runs through it. And so you can have the heating fluid like molten salt oil or anything that can withstand the high temperature from the sun that is concentrated to it. And that heat is transported and exchanged and used to convert water to steam to power your turbine and generate electricity. So that's the overall kind of principle behind the technology. Now, this technology is, 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 uh, is, can be used to power a lot of other industrial applications. For instance, if the, if the most advanced countries are talking about uh, hydrogen, right? Hydrogen powered vehicles and things like that. This technology, if cited in the, in, for instance, in North Africa or some, or, you know, north or south of the Sahara Desert, for instance, to power the African continent where you have the resources, then we can actually use this in this amount of heat and energy to really uh, produce hydrogen for, for our use as well, or even to drive our, um, water desal uh, desalination plants, or even to do biomass gasification, because hydrogen can be gasified from natural gas, which we also have in, in the continent as well. So these are some of the, to make natural gas exploration even greener. And this gives some form of energy security, in a sense, to where the energy resources is available. Okay, not you know, so you have accessibility. You have you able to access the energy that you have because you have access to the technology. So this is one. Uh, uh, so this is the tech, this is where the technology bit is very 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 uh, critical. Uh, in in terms of securing energy, uh, ensuring energy security. Now this is a picture, a global map of where the the uh, the, the concentrated solar power plant projects are going on at the moment. So you can see the distribution, 
right? So you have one in Morocco, you have one in Tunisia and Algeria and Egypt. You also have in China, a lot of them in China. You have in Australia, you have in South Africa, and you have in Chile. Now, if you look at it, you would expect to have a lot more in this continent of Africa. But even those that have done, that have been uh, uh, developed in Africa, it's not for the African market, it's to power Europe. Because if you go back to the previous slides, the part of uh, the world where you have the least solar thermal radiation is in Northern Europe. And that's where they, they need the, the solar energy. So they're, they're planning to use underwater sea, uh, power cables, right, to, to uh, transport electricity and then cut off dependency on the gas supply from countries like Russia and the rest. So, and so the, the, so you can see uh, from these uh, texts here, Spain, Southern Spain, yes, USA, and maybe China, and then Morocco, South Africa, and then that's all that's all there is, right? And then you, you can see on the other side where the North African CSP industry is expected to attract up to $63 billion uh, by 2040 to power European economies. Right, Germany, Italy, UK, France, and you know, and, and the rest. So it's not really to power the continent. So it's not really about accessibility uh, uh, to these energy resources for the African continent, but also it's just for the European uh, 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 continent. And I think this is where the essence of what energy security really means for all globally is really, really critical. Okay, and there's a huge potential here because, of course, we've seen that the, the climate change is increasing, right? The, the, the temperature, you know, globally is increasing, but yet we can still analyze the energy and, and try to and use that reverse process to mitigate the effect as well. So there's a huge potential in solar uh, energy uh, globally, uh, but it has to be, there has to be a balanced approach in terms of uh, the resources to that we have abundantly across the world, and also the accessibility to these resources, and also uh, how affordable these uh, uh, energy would be in the long run. Um, so a key part of the energy security uh, strand, the three strand I made reference to, uh, is that the three of them is sits on material sustainability, and this is where it all ties up to. So if the last piece is about reducing the cost of energy. So in the context of the solar system, reducing the cost of solar thermal electricity. That means those plants, as I have described previously, needs to be run more efficiently. That means you have to increase efficiency to a very high level. Means That means you have to get more out of what you are putting in. So if, for instance, you're concentrating the heat uh, from the sun to power your turbine at say 500 degrees C, you want to be able to do that at a higher temperature. That means you're going to get more energy out of the plant. And to be able to do that, you need materials then. Uh, you need first the heating fluid to be able to run through the plant to carry the heat across to the heat to the turbine and power your electricity, generate electricity. But also you need material to be able to sustain that, to be able to deliver that. So your pipings, your towers, everything has to be resilient. So if they are going to be carrying a hot fluid such as oil or salt or liquid metals as a way of heat transfer from the sun to your turbine to generate electricity, the materials, the metals for the piping, the valves, they have to be very resilient because we are looking at infrastructure that will last for 30 years. And they have to be efficient and they have to uh, be such that there's less intervention in between operation so that all these are the, the, the aspects that can bring the cost of energy uh, down. So for you to be able to do that, you need metals, right? You need nickel, you need aluminum, you need copper. Copper, for instance, has relevance in electric vehicles, right? And then you need lithium for your lithium batteries to store energy that you are getting and all of these. And these, again, these material resources is also becoming a problem because one of the uh, saying I read recently was that the push towards the you know different energy means to have alternative form of energy that is sustainable energy and all of that is fine and good, but what is missing is that we might the, the, the we don't have the materials to be able to deliver it to unless it you know the energy and make it available for end use. Now for us to be able to do that, 
we might end up replacing non-renewable oil and gas with our metal ores becoming non-renewable itself. So can we possibly run out of nickel ores or alumina? Alumina, where you get aluminum from. And all of these, again, we were tied to uh, the whole global north and global south divide because most of these resources, Africa, for instance, has 30% of most of the uh, minerals, right, for, the, for which you get metals to deliver the new energy mix that, uh, that, that we are all talking about. And then this, you know, plays a, it becomes a center stage for polit geopolitics, wars, regime change, uh, government policies, human attitudes, economic sabotage, farming, as we've seen. So you can see uh, Zimbabwe, for instance, recently passed a law that says all the miners of lithium from Zimbabwe has to invest it back in Zimbabwe. So again, the the global north, people with the, the countries with technology to harness these uh, energy, they want to come and get the resources from where it is, right? And that's all they care about, not really about making energy available for everyone or making everyone feel energy secured in a very fair way. So this is the kind of interlink between the technology to get access to energy, the energy resources itself, and then the what the trying to make it affordable for everyone and then all built on material sustainability. Um, and then I'll just talk about civil nuclear. So that's on the solar. Civil nuclear is a very interesting uh, one because, of course, it has a very significant global bias that the world is still trying to get around. Uh, I know government policies around the world is trying to navigate that with laws and things like that. In the UK, for instance, they've now defined nuclear energy as green in a certain way. Uh, but some of the significant uh, bias comes from the very negative publicity civil nuclear has received in the last uh, decade. One of the most uh, recent and most prominent is the Fukushima disaster in Japan, but also the cases of proliferations uh, of uh, nuclear technology. And also the on the you know the seemingly uh, unfair advantage most nuclear uh, uh, key players key stakeholders in the nuclear industry feel that uh, the renewable energy uh, uh, what's it called the renewable energy uh, uh, companies have advantage in terms of subsidies and things like that. So again. That is a very, very important part because now with the UK redefining nuclear energy to be uh, more like green, it will not benefit from the subsidies that other renewable energy systems are benefiting. And then that would open up uh, opportunity for investment in civil nuclear. Uh, but, you know, of course, proliferation would mean that countries like Niger in the south of the Sahara that has huge deposit of uranium would not have access to uh, the technology to harness uh, nuclear electricity. Okay, so there's a bit of, you know, geopolitics there again with the proliferation concerns. And of course, the cost of um, building very massive uh, uh, nuclear facilities. A case in point is the Inkley uh, uh, power plant in, in the UK which was supposed to start in 2017, now it's going to start in 2027. Initial cost is 18 billion, but now it's going to uh, uh, 26 billion. So that is some of the negative publicity around uh, uh, civil nuclear and how uh, governments of the world are trying to circumnavigate that at the moment. But of course, there's always this perennial concern about uh, nuclear waste. And this is where the developed world is trying to look for ways and new designs of nuclear energy systems to minimize the uh, uh, waste, nuclear waste that is generated. Uh, but if you look at the text I put here, I said nuclear waste disposal is more of a is becoming more of a political problem and no longer a technological problem. So this is why this is where the global bias really comes in, and. Uh, you know, everyone can make the case for nuclear, right? Pro and, and, and for, uh, pro and against. But the, the 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 centerpiece of it is that if is if nuclear energy is going to be used globally, it's going to be used globally, available in terms of the technology for everyone to use and have access to the technology and have access to the energy that comes from it, and nobody is disadvantaged economically 
globally, then we can we can all embrace it in a way, in a fair way, especially with the new technology that is coming out as well. So that's you know that's just about the global bias and how some countries are trying to to navigate that. Now, in terms of the technology itself, um, of course, excuse me, there's um, uh, the current nuclear uh, energy system is built on nuclear fusion, which is splitting of uh, fissile materials. And then the energy generated, which in form of heat, can be conveyed to power turbine, just in the case of the solar as well. And so there have been an evolution of some sort of um, uh, uh, nuclear nuclear systems, energy system over a long period of time. So from the 1950s, you have Gen 1 and you, Gen 2, and then you have Gen 3, Gen 3 plus. So we are now in Generation 4. And the thing about this is that Generation 4 nuclear designs, they're not in the market yet. So everything you see around today is all uh, prototype design or conceptualizations and all of that. And most of them is, uh, you have the sodium cooled fast reactor, the very high temperature uh, reactor, gas. So basically, when they say gas cooled, molten salt, and all of this, it's just about the kind of flu- the, the the kind of fluid that they use to come to take um, and nest the heat generated in a nuclear uh, the core of a nuclear reactor and make that heat available in the form of electricity through a turbine. So the sodium cooled means that they're using sodium, liquid sodium, to transfer the energy. Um, and all of that. Now, the new design is built on 4K principle, and the, the, they are on sustainability. And sustainability, in a sense, also means uh, minimum w- uh, nuclear waste. Uh, safety and reliability means there will be less material need, you know, over a long period of time, right? And then economic competitiveness, making it more small scale, in a sense making it more civil so that it minimizes the, res, the, the, the bias of proliferation, okay? And making, making sure that when countries or nations are trying to design some of these or use some of these uh, nuclear energy technology for civil purposes, there is the, there's no risk of proliferation for, for uh, arms and all of that. So that's kind of the, 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 the four bases for developing the Generation 4 uh, nuclear reactor designs. From my perspective, from a research perspective, I'm more interested in the uh, molten salt nuclear reactor. Now, the reason for that is the, the first commercial version of the molten salt reactor will be in the market, let's say, in 2030. The reason is because the same molten salt that is used in this case to take the heat from the core of a reactor to power turbine and make electricity available is the same molten so that is used to take the heat from the sun to power the turbine in the solar power plant. So you can see the connection there. And again, it's all about energy resources and technology to assess the energy. Uh, for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa North or South of the Sahara and most tropical nations of the world, a CSP plant would be the viable technology to explore. In other part of the world where you don't have that much direct solar radiation, where you're able to have the technology to create a fissile material in a reactor core, then the molten salt or the nuclear reactor can be used. Um, in the UK, for instance, we have the, they're trying to make, of course, the small modular reactors where it's a small, a small, very small size portable that can just power a section of a city or a specific industrial application. You don't have to have a whole massive power plant from a nuclear reactor just powering the whole, the whole town for you to get access to electricity. So you can actually have a portable one at the back of your company, your industrial applications, it just powers your office and your applications and all of that. So that is where, that's the direction of the generation four uh, nuclear energy systems. Uh, are going in. So again, accessibility to technology is a very integral part of uh, energy security in this context as well. So I guess it's a question where whether this technology can be really available to everyone irrespective of which nations of the world needs one, wants to use it, wherever you are in this world. This is just to give a, a quick you know, description of what the, the nuclear technology really means, the multi reactor. So I have here the core where you have the heat generated because of the 
the f- fusion reaction. And then the yellow part is just the, the molten salt going through from the core to being transferred to the what we call the the heat extraction circuit. So you have the molten salt, the heat from the core is transported to an intermediate loop of molten salt. That heat goes at higher, uh, 700 degrees C. And then it goes to heat exchanger where is the water flows through and the water is converted to steam, super heat steam, and goes to a turbine with a generator. And then you have electricity. So that is the working principle of uh, the molten salt reactor. Okay, that's a power generation circuit. Now, the the the, re- the when it comes to energy security, the, the next big thing, which is very interesting from a research perspective, is nuclear fusion. Now, the physics has not been sorted yet, but it's coming. So basically, with fusion, you're splitting the fissile material. With fusion, you're fusing, it's like creating the sun, the heat of the sun in a reactor core. And you need to transfer that heat in the reactor core from fusion to uh, uh, to electricity generation. Now, if that's, uh, the physics is cracked, if we're able to crack the physics around nuclear fusion, then that, that would probably be the end of uh, uh, fossil fuel, oil, and gas. But again, that's just about the resources. The next thing is, would nuclear fusion technology be available for everyone to ensure that we are all energy secured? Our economies are powered. Our social and technological appetite are fueled. You know, and, and you know, innovation to deal with drought with, you know, maybe water desalination in where you have drought to recycle water. All these are all high energy intensive uh, technology or processes. So nuclear fusion is coming. It will still apply to the same uh, process as well of harnessing the energy uh, uh, to, to power our homes. So that's on the technology side. Um, so the in the first slide, I mentioned that the whole tripod of what I've described or what I think entails energy security is built on material sustainability. So in this slide, I'm going to try to establish the link to material optimization, which is where which is where my the core of my research is really. So again, one of this one of the uh, the strand of what I call energy security is low cost affordable electricity. The target is to reduce the cost of renewable and low carbon electricity, whether it's from solar or nuclear or tidal, or whatever we, we you know system we want to explore. In the context of solar and nuclear, you want to improve your performance of your of your technology that's been designed to harness it. You want to increase it to more than 50%. At the moment, it's not even up to 50%. And sometimes the, 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 the limitation in terms of efficiency is tied to the material available to withstand the conditions within which the energy is being generated. Metals would, some metals would just disappear with use at 800, 900 degrees C to try to get heat from the sun and power our home. So we need to improve the efficiency on that side. I know a 100 megawatts of uh, solar power plant in South Africa, the cost of materials is 31% of the total budget of the plant. That's how significant material optimization is. So that we don't start on, you know, fighting over metal halls across the world. I, I guess if that is the case, then the global south, which is rich in those mineral ores, will be the battlefield. I'm not surprised why a lot of nations are coming to Africa right now to build a you know, bilateral relationship I think it's tied to the minerals to, to be able to support the new energy mix of the next uh, next decades uh, going forward. Lithium, copper for electrical vehicles and all of that. Okay, so these are some of the, this is the link here. So if we get to the point where, of course, the new fu- uh, nuclear fusion technology is, is, uh, is, uh, comes to play, then we are looking at greater than 1,000 degrees C for 30 years of application. So materials is needed. Why are they needed? They are needed for storing the, con- the containment material to store the, the heat in, in the salt, the receiver that receives the heat from the sun that's concentrated, the pumps to pump the, 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 the molten salt with heat, heat to power your turbine and generate electricity. The valves, all these are all made from uh, materials, pipings. So, uh, so many heat exchangers, and you can't be replacing all of these 
as if not the, the, the target of reducing the cost of energy would never be attained. So all of these then is tied to sustainable material resources. Is all tied to sustainable material resources. So this is where my research uh, as an academic really comes in. How do we understand how materials, different materials inter, uh, interact with these very extreme and demanding environment? And how can we make material more resilient? How can we do that? Once we are able to do that from an R&D perspective, then we have made contribution to reduce the cost of um, energy production. And then maybe poorer nations of the world can afford this kind of energy and the technology that comes that, that helps to unless it. So this is the interlink between what I've defined as energy security in the beginning to material sustainability and, 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 and global security. So I, I know in the previous slide, I've explained so many scenarios, right? Where, you, where material is needed, pumps and valves. From a research perspective, this is what is really happening. Uh, the the the, well, the light blue line on, on the need is a material. The one that looks like water on top is a molten salt. So you're gonna have in the core of your reactor, you're gonna have heat flux because you have high temperature. High temperature would heat up materials every any time and any day. You also have bombardment of irradiation from the from the core of your reactors, for instance. So the heat flux on its own can come from the solar and also from the heat how hot the reactor core would be, but also you have a lot of neutral irradiation as well, which is not very good for materials. And then there's corrosion and there's so many things. And then you have the movement of valves and pumps and all of that. Those will bring tribological uh, damages uh, to your materials. So what I've just pieced here, though is a bit technical, but it just appends a picture of the contributing factors that drives material degradation, why material sustainability is very, very important. So if you put any material in a solar power plant with molten salt or a nuclear reactor with molten salt, the kind of what I've depicted here, the degradation, level of degradation I've depicted here is what you would expect. And this is why most nations with the, the mineral ores for these metals, they are to be, uh, how do I say it now? They, they are like the, the beautiful bride in the whole thing, in the whole energy mix. And that is why countries, maybe China, the US, everyone is coming to Africa because that is where you have a huge deposit of these minerals. And because we need them, you know, every now and then. But from my perspective and for us academics, we try to make sure that we don't use all of our mineral oils too quickly because we need energy. So we have to devise ways to make the materials that we have more resilient. Okay. We have to understand these interactions and try to see how we can improve the the, the resilience. So that is kind of where R&D helps to uh, bring down the price of energy. And um, so corrosion and, and, and is a very important part. And uh, so from a, from a materials perspective, uh, what the new, the state of the art is always, uh, there's discussion around air, iron entropy alloys, new kind of material alloys has been developed specifically for these kind of conditions. Now, these entropy alloys, again, they are very expensive. So research is continuing to make the use of high entropy alloys in this energy system even more affordable to bring down the cost of energy so that it can be cheap, it can be affordable for, uh, uh, for, for, the, for the global society. Things like ceramics or even self-functionalizing means you have a material interface where it interacts with these very extreme conditions where the energy is being produced but they can heal themselves, they can self-heal on, on their own. If we can crack that, then we can significantly bring the price of, uh, of energy down. And of course, uh, high temperature uh, insulations uh, as well. So these are, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you're able to see the, 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 in, the interconnectivity between energy demand, um, climate, the push to decarbonize and Deal with climate change, energy demand, and the resources, both materials and energy itself, and how all of these can be tied to what we term as uh, uh, global energy security issues. So this is, I hope that that has really come true um, in the course of the presentation. And uh, I think that brings me to the end uh, of my talk today, and I'm happy to be here, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A uh, uh, session later on.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pesso. Again, very interesting, and at least for me as well, there are a number of questions that, that I have. We probably are only limited by, by time. Uh, but I too am looking forward to the, the end of the, uh, of the talks when we will be able to pose some questions. Uh, so we are moving on to our next presenter, and that is Dr. Omar Huerta, from the University of Leeds in the UK. And Omar is going to tell us a bit about his interests and his concerns as they relate to human-centered design and security. So Dr. Omar, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, Curtis, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the, the GS network for the invitation. I find the, the work that the network, the network is currently doing very good, and definitely it is, it is needed. So thank you again for the invite. My name is Omar Huerta. I'm a lecturer in product design at the University of Leeds in UK. My research focuses on human-centered design and design-driven innovation applied to physical products and services. And today, I would like to talk a little bit about human-centered design and how it can help us develop a strategy to shape a more sustainable future. So I hope that you, that you, can, that you enjoy this small presentation. Well, my background is in, in product design, where I have been helping some well-known brands and companies to design products and services for the past 15 years, covering a wide range of products, such as electronic appliances, packaging, medical devices, and fashion accessories, and a few other bits. And I have helped these companies not to only develop what I believe are good products and services, but also to implement human-centered design at the core of their product development and innovation strategies. So this is my, my, my area of expertise. Over the years, I have transformed myself from a product designer that all I care about was the latest product, the latest service, or the latest new technology to be, to be launched. And I have changed. I have evolved to now where I am really worried about the state of, of our world, the, the, the many different societal issues that, that we are facing today. And some of them have to do or something to do with the economics, some with politics, some with the access to education, hunger, food, access to water, sanitation, and many other different things that, that we are facing today. And as a designer, I am really interested in those issues because I truly believe that there is something that, that we can do through, through design. And I also believe that, they, that we need to move design from, from just designing simple small objects or things to, to use design to create systems, political systems, improve healthcare systems, design solutions to get access to the clean water that we need, education and healthcare systems. Now, it is important that when, when I talk about, about design, or I use the term design, I refer to a, to a process which is creative and it aims to, to solve a problem. I'm not just using the, the term design to make any reference to a to, to any aesthetic criteria. Think of design as a, as a creative problem solving process that delivers tangible or non-tangible solutions from the, or from a clear understanding of a problem and in most cases, human needs or wants or desires. Well, some of you may think that the design process is, is linear where you will find a problem and then work out a solution straight away. Well, in reality, if you could have a look at the designer's thought, thoughts and their design process, it will look pretty much like the visual that you got on your right-hand side. This is what the design process looks like. It is a quite complex and entangled process that is, or it could be everything but, but linear. 
a process that will allow you to define what the real problem is, to then understand it properly, and to then try to explore the many different possible solutions in an iterative way. Well, within this uh, iterative process, there are many ways of thinking that get into play. For example, there is a divergent thinking that we use to explore the many possibilities for a problem solution. And there is also a convergent thinking that we use when we need to focus on reaching a one well-defined solution for a particular problem. Now, the first one is a bit more creative, whereas the second one is a bit more logical. But we also have something else that is quite common across, across designers, and this is the abductive thinking or the abductive reasoning. And during the design process, as we keep moving from divergent to convergent thinking, there is a need for synthesis. We need to synthesize all the information that we have been producing or collecting. And this synthesis process is facilitated by this abductive thinking. And designers are very good at that. They are good at organizing complexity and finding clarity within the chaos. And many authors have many authors have tried to, to define the different phases within this design process. You will probably find quite a few different ones and different ways different ways of presenting this process and its different phases. But what is important, or I believe it is it is very important, is to keep in mind and at the core of this design process, the stakeholders involved those human beings we are working with. So that is something we, we should keep in mind whenever we are approaching a, a project. And when we talk about the stakeholders or human beings, we are talking about different perspectives, different ways of seeing things. And what is true for you in a particular context or situation may not be true for someone else in a different context. And that is very important. So that's why we use this human-centered design because everything else or everything is, is about perspectives. So how is human-centered design helping us understand the many perceptions or ways of seeing the world? Over the past, well, over the years, the designers have started to, to use uh, an approach that we call now human-centered design, and they are using it within their, their current design process. Now, this approach aims to keep that human being at the core of anything we do, and this approach is also helping now companies and researchers to approach different challenges with a, with a new perspective a perspective that is creative and also empathetic. So human-centered design will hit the, the overlapping of these three, three main constraints that are presented in this Venn diagram, where you got the desirability, the feasibility, and the viability. Now, the challenge with this approach is to try to find the balance between these three different constraints. And, but the process, the process will always start at the understanding of what people need, what they desire, or what they may want. But I can say that the human-centered design is all about cultivating deep empathy with the people that we are working for and working with. And empathy is going to be always at the core of the process because without a clear understanding, a clear understanding of what the others may think, feel, and see, and experience, probably any kind of work that we are trying to do will be pointless. So this is also very, very important for whenever we try to address really global challenges. For example, have you ever been in that particular situation where, where you're trying to use a product or a service and that makes you think, what were they thinking of when they, they came out with this particular solution? So that is why now designers are trying to use this approach to try to address this, this, these difficulties whenever you are trying to use these products or these different services. And I can tell that whenever you notice or that design that is noticed is probably that one that is wrongly done. Good design probably is invisible. All 
Okay, now coming back to, to the global challenges. The, we are talking about using design and helping, well, and use it uh, along with human-centered design to help us develop strategies or solutions for big problems, something that goes beyond just individual people. So how can we use human-centered design to try to tackle those big challenges, those really meaningful challenges? That is, I guess, the, the, big, the big question. Now, what I'm gonna I'm gonna present you is a small case study I have been working on along with other academics uh, from different universities. The, the the project started a bit before the COVID outbreak and was paused for for some some time, but I believe this case study will help me capture the essence and value of human-centered design and what it could bring into projects that are trying to address these global these these global issues. Now, the project, it started as a collaboration between different disciplines and the original idea was to try to implement the original Finnish baby box idea into other contexts to help improve infant and maternal care. So that was roughly what the project was about. And we were aiming to implement this, this idea into different, different contexts. One was in Vietnam and the other one was in Zambia. Now, just a bit of background. The Finnish baby box was developed in, and implemented during the 1930s when about 65 of every 1,000 Finnish babies tend to die eh, during the first year. And poor families didn't have enough, enough money for proper clothes, and the parents slept in bed with the infants, and that was a major risk factor for the sudden infant death syndrome. Now, the box, the baby box, was meant to provide all the Finnish babies with an equal start, including a safe and separate sleeping space. So that was the, the, original, the original idea. The idea at the time, it was quite successful to a point that it continued to be, to be used in the country and it became even part of their culture. So it was a great success. And that success uh, was, well, it, re even, it even reached, reached out the, the, the outer world to, to a point where the exact, exactly the same idea was tried to, to be implemented in different, different contexts and situations in a kind of colonial way, I must say. Now, this approach, for example, was, or it, 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 was, it, it was used in, in, in Mexico where the same baby box was implemented, although unarguably not with the, the same results. The project in this particular context was not successful and it didn't take off in the, in the way that the government was, was expecting. Uh, now, the person that is, is smiling here in the, in the picture was a, a well-known member from a political party. And perhaps the idea uh, and the implementation of the baby box was a bit different from that original idea during the, the Finnish baby box example. Now, coming back to the case study, uh, during this project, we traveled to, to the province of Kontum in Vietnam to understand whether this, this baby box could help improve the infant and maternal, and maternal care provisions. So the infant and maternal care were a big issue, but that was all we knew. And when I, when I joined the project, the Finnish baby box was already an idea that was put on the table. So that was actually, actually happening. Now, once we, we arrived to, to Contum, we spent quite some time trying to, to understand the context of the problem and the different systems that were interconnected to this particular issue. We knew that the baby box was not a solution fit for the current situation, although that was not, not, not really a surprise for us. Then the province is still, or was still recovering from a long period of conflict during the, the Vietnam War. And there are still strong political views in the region that along with the high, well, the, 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 the region is producing coffee and rubber and that is coming along with all the inequities that usually these practices tend to, to bring along. 
that as well with some some cultural and social social barriers. So that was really a, a complex scenario for for that original baby box idea to be to be implemented. So with that better understanding of the, the context and the, the real problem, we, we ran a few co-design workshops with the community. These workshops allow us to, to, to understand even more other aspects around the problem we were trying to tackle, as well as have a better understanding of the different systems involved in this particular problem. Systems like the political system, the communal system, the regional and local healthcare system, the family system and a few other ones. So as I was telling you, this was a very complex uh, interwined situ situation. So during the, the, the co-design workshops uh, and using a few design tools and different methodologies, we, we gather enough, enough insight to co-design and co-produce a few alternatives for the infant and maternal care provision. Now, these few alternatives were, were designed in a, in a very iterative way during the workshops and also they were done in a very quick way. So that allows us to, to gather real-time feedback and early access Early, early assess the, the potential for these different ideas. So that was very, very important during the, the co-design sessions. And that is, that is why I would like to, to also highlight the, the importance of non-perfect solutions for whenever we use this, this, this approach. During our visit, we realized the, the connection between mother, child, and the textiles. We, we understood the role these textiles have in the community and the meaning they have for them. So one of the alternatives was to, to weave some information relevant to the infant and maternal care into the textiles in the same kind of way patterns are woven to describe stories or, or represent a particular topic. This idea was then presented uh, using, well, to the, to the community using uh, some reduced paper we had at the time that was put together using some tape and with some drawings, drawings on it, uh, just with enough detail to, to evaluate the idea and understand its full potential. So the idea was developed a bit, a bit more to be fully integrated into, integrated into the existing local system. Then the solution now is looking to help educating the community on the importance of infant and maternal care to help train the community and volunteers on the best practices around infant and maternal care. Also part of this strategy is to, to empower the local women and the community to break down some gender related barriers to access healthcare in general. And finally, to, to help strengthening the, the, the infant and maternal care education through small design interventions that will continue to be implemented in, the, in that particular context. So how we can, or how help, sorry, so how, how human-centered design could, could help us develop a, a strategy towards a more sustainable future. So human-centered design involves us, as you have, have seen, talking in, taking into account uh, people's needs and limitations, the way, the, way, the way we think as human, human beings, the way we behave and interact with our surroundings. But as mentioned before, we need to address bigger, bigger issues. We need to, to take action and, and I believe we can address those global issues through, through some design. I believe we need to, to move design from just designing those small objects I was telling you to design now better systems. So if we move from human centered, from that human centered design notion where we consider people, we design for us individuals and then change that towards humanity centered design, then I believe we, we can focus on them as communities and with that, we can, we can have a better chance to, to succeed. Now, humanity is an important part of, of life, which tells us to, to help others, to try to understand others and realize the people problems uh, with our own eyes and to try to, to help them. So the societal living then is, is possible when there is this communal harmony and a feeling of brotherhood among, 
among ourselves. And I really believe that that is possible. And there is a, a big stream of researchers and designers that are working very hard to, to achieve this. Now, human center design represents, sorry, the humanity center design represents the, the ultimate challenge for, for us designers to try to, to help people improve their lives. Whereas human center design is about individuals, humanity center expands this, this, this view far beyond to the societal level and where, where we face really high complex issues that are usually entangled in very sophisticated human-made systems. So that is the, the, important, the important part of this approach. So humanity-centered design focuses on people's needs, not as individuals, but as societies with complex, deep-rooted problems. And in the context of global issues, we can co-create proper solutions when we work with populations. Then we can try to address the right, pro the right problems by understanding why they are actually happening and by understanding that they happen within complex systems. And then finally, we can try to address those issues by, by co-designing small and also simple interventions. And I will be commenting a bit more about that later on. So, there are a few humanity-centered design principles that I believe can, can be applied to global challenges to help us develop these strategies towards a more sustainable future. So, these are my top 10 principles. They are quite similar to those from the human-centered design approach. So, if you are already uh, familiar with that approach, you will find that there are a few similarities, but then this can, can be applied as, as a humanity-centered approach for any global challenge project. Now, the first one is to consider design as a way of thinking and as a way to address systemic issues. So if you have the chance to work or invite other designers into your projects, try to make the most of their strategic way of thinking. Try to tap on their design process and also to make a good use of their design toolbox. So there are many different approaches tools and methodologies that we use in design that can be applied to, to whenever we are trying to work with communities. The second one is to focus on the people that we are trying to help to make appropriate solutions for them. So other approaches don't center that much around specific populations or account for all the factors that influence the designing for particular groups. So keeping the population and humanity at the core of our project for as long as we can is quite quite essential if we really want to, to tackle those global issues. The following one is trying to solve the right problem. So try to solve always the root issue, not just the problem that is presented and that, and that usually is, is just the symptom, not the cause of that, that particular issue. We need to try to dig deep and examine what is the cause and effect chain very carefully to understand what are all the different um, reasons what that particular problem is actually, actually arising. Then the number four, the following one, is to try to see everything as a system so these days everything is interconnected and the actions that we take in one part of the globe can have a ripple effect across many other different regions. So there may not be a simple source of the problem because this interconnected nature of, of our world today. So that's why we need to, to address everything as a system. And it is usually that the effects of one problem will extend back through a series of other, other issues within an intricate system. The next, the next point is don't try to rush to a solution. So regarding people, societies, and the various forces that, that bind them together, uh, our first solution usually won't be the, the right one. And that is why we need to take small and simple interventions into place to see where this can go 
and then just continue modifying things until that desired effect can, can occur. The following one is always include the people we are designing for in the process. So that is to work out our way towards the best solution for the right problem. And it is usually communities that already have great insights into their problems. And they just need some support to help them come up with the solutions uh, for that for that particular situation. The following one is to always include experts. That's also very, very important. Uh, using a multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary approach, uh, we will tap on the talents and the influence of everyone who can get behind into a particular project to, to make it succeed. This is very important. And, and we also need to include the people that we are working with and working for uh, all the way throughout the, the process of the project, not, not only at the, at the very end. Then the following point is avoiding, dis avoiding to discuss the problem by its symptoms. So while a symptom is usually needs treatment, other experts typically won't go any any deeper. Hence, why the symptoms may may always always uh, return. Instead, try to to remember that beneath the surface of a of a problem lurks the the majority of the of the iceberg. And within that hard to see mass, we will gradually discover what is the the root cause of that particular problem. And then we could easily find ways to connect that root cause with with the the remaining discoveries that we have been making. Then we're cl we'll close to the end. The, the following one is to, to model through via small, simple interventions. So do small, simple interventions to tackle the most important problem. See what works and what brings, uh, brings you closer to that sustainable solution. By doing this, uh, we will allow, or it will allow us to, to monitor the results, to modify the, the approach that, that, we are, that we are taking, and to keep experimenting. And with that, we will continue to learn from what we see and fine tune the, the interventions that we are making towards a more successful outcome. And finally, gain more influence. So as we continue, or as you continue to, to, to rise in your organization, you will have more influence to achieve more for more people. So as you gain influence, try to use this in a very positive way. So these are the, the, ten, the 10 principles that I believe can, can be used for any particular project that is, that is trying to, to address a global, a global issue. Now, finally, I would like to, to finish by mentioning a few things we, we may need to keep an eye on when we try to address these global issues. So things are changing, but we tend to live in, in monocultures where we learn from the same universities, reading perhaps the same books, talking to the same people, and that develops monocultures where we tend to think in a kind of similar way. And that is a danger, or I believe it's a danger. And uh, Any monoculture is bad, we need to, to diversify. We need diversity. Um, for example, if we think about a garden where we have the same plant species, and if there is a disease, probably our plants will be wiped out. And if we think the same, if we think the same, that is not a very robust thing to do when, when something happens. And these days are many things going on and then that's why we need this diversity or diverse way of thinking. We also believe in a, we, we also believe in a complex economic system that that is struggling, and also the political systems are are also damaged, and we need to be very conscious, very conscious when when we when we when we when we start up our, our projects, and that's gonna that's gonna connect with the following point. We are we are living in an age that everything could be could be a lie, so how do we? do evidence-based work is very, very important. 
misinformation can can lead to develop something that could be good for the economic or political system, but could be really bad for, for us as humankind. So we need to be aware of that. So as you have seen, there are many, many big issues, many, many concerns that one single individual cannot even think about, about trying to address them all. But what we can try to do is to band together with other people that may be addressing the same issues and to try our best with humanity at the core of whatever we whatever we, we will be doing. So this is this is where, where I will finish my, my presentation. I'm gonna be leaving my contact details in just well, just in case you would like to, to reach out or have any any questions, I will be more than happy to to answer those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Huerta. Uh, again, very interesting presentation. And it uh, was a great way to end our discussions this morning and the, the set of presentations for our uh, Global Security Perspective Symposium. Uh, I just have a few questions that I'd like to, to pose to, to the participants this morning and the presenters. And, and first, I'd like to go to Dr. Ogun Dani. Uh, Dr. Ogandani, you had mentioned a number of very interesting and thought-provoking things. Uh, one of them that I was particularly interested in, in hearing a little bit about was your uh, information about Mom Connect and Nurse Connect. Um, and because even here in the Caribbean, there are a number of rural areas that you know, getting to them poses some challenges. I was wondering, what was the challenge or the challenges that those two, I'm guessing, applications were designed to overcome? And secondly, how successful has it been reported to her to have been? Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Curtis, for your question. So at the beginning, okay, within the African context, uh, there's been high infant and maternal mortality rates. So as a form of solution to addressing that high uh, infant and maternal mortality rate and bringing it down, technology was uh, adopted as a likely solution. And when I say technology, I'm talking about the, the basics of technology, which is uh, short message servicing, whereby when mothers, pregnant mothers and pregnant women, when they come to the hospital, their details get uh, collected, stored, so that they are able to provide updates, okay, about the different stages of uh, their maternal journey and what uh, it is that they are confused about so that there's an operator who, who is obviously a professional nurse that can now assist. Now, the issues or the challenges with that is it was not a two-way communication system. It was just a function of the, the mother sending out an SMS and sometimes for months they do not receive uh, a feedback so that was an issue that that's one of the key challenges but the sms was used to reach a larger number of uh, nursing mothers or new new mothers and then in terms of the success rates um i think in terms of the provinces in south africa for example i think it's about the major metro metropolis or metropolitan cities that have recorded major successes in terms of the effectiveness of mom connect compared to the rural uh, areas so when it comes to technology as a driver of the solution i think it needs to there's a need to keep on refining products to the optimal 
level where we can say, okay, we have gotten rid of this uh, problem of infant and maternal maternity or even access to information. I hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Gandani. It, it does, and, and you know, leveraging the, the high penetration of cellular phones, I think is an excellent idea. And I, I know many solutions, certainly in, in recent times, have incorporated the use of uh, cellular phones. Uh, Dr. Pesu, I have a, a couple of questions, just a couple. Uh, you had mentioned concentrated solar power plants and in particular mentioned their efficiencies and low operation costs. Now, here in the Caribbean as well, you know, we have lots of sun and solar power available to us. Um, but I was wondering, what are the barriers to entry, in particular, maybe the startup costs for things like solar power plants, sorry, concentrated solar power plants? Yeah, uh, thank you. Very, very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I think the, this is yeah, this is kind of the, the disadvantage. What I've discovered that some of the countries with these resources do have, which is access to capital. Now, the the concentrated solar power plants can be is a game changer in the sense as the storage mechanism for this heat helps to deal with the intermittency of, of solar power. So you can always, you know, I didn't go into the details. So you have the, during the peak time, you store a lot of the excess heat getting from the sun mm -hmm. in a hot storage tank. And at night time, when you don't have any direct solar radiation on the top. So it's a, having that, that technology is a game changer because there is this, uh, I call it the black hole of energy storage sorted but it needs a lot of capital investment, right? And this is a key challenge. Uh, so in the case of some of the development in North Africa, some of the countries financing those projects are from um, uh, Europe, right? So I know some countries in the UK, of course, we don't have that much sun in the UK, but countries in the UK see economic benefit in investing in, uh, in Tunisia, in Egypt and, and the likes. So in, in the place of the Caribbean, it's all the government policy on how you can get direct, uh, you know, direct investment cash flow and the guarantee uh, using the, the instrument of government to guarantee that, you know, you can leverage it over 30 years, the repayment plan and things like that. And you can generate a lot of energy and drive your economy and generate income to pay back. And the investment it can be within the Caribbean or from Astana. Uh, sources, but they have to be that balance, and this is where, um, you know, the narrow-mindedness of economies. The, you know, you know, it's like the bigger economies will always want to have their ways and things like that. But I think the biggest challenge would be uh, capital investment for materials, for the infrastructure, the technology, and, and the likes. Once you can have that cash, initial cash flow, then you're going to be the system that can, that can power. You don't need to buy oil anymore. We should not be good for for a country like Nigeria, but uh, to be good for the Caribbean, I suppose. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, I also know that South Africa is still experiencing load shedding. Uh, you had also mentioned, Dr. Peso, that the UK government was increasing the use of nuclear power, plans to increase their use of nuclear power. But I also recall fairly recently that Germany, for example, has stopped producing energy from nuclear power plants. So I was I was wondering, given the concerns you know, that you had also mentioned, for example, waste disposal, and maybe some of the the expected benefits. Maybe, for example, you also mentioned uh, nuclear fusion, which we're hopeful to um, overcome the, the the challenges posed by 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 the physics involved. Do you have any insight or any thoughts as to why the UK? is actually increasing its reliance on nuclear power when other countries are decreasing or eliminating it. Right, so I think this is where um, a bit of geopolitics come into play. So Germany is abandoning, I mean, the government of Angela Merkel before she left, you know, was phasing out uh, nuclear. I think there was a consensus around Europe of doing that, one by, um, France as well, and Germany, and even the UK. 
uh, I think it was a big political issue in the last two election cycles where about the determined nuclear, nuclear arsenal in the UK and all of that. But then the, the whole thing about Russia, the whole Russia-Ukraine war, and then it was seen that gas could be, you know, the Germany was dependent on the, 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 the natural gas from Russia and most of the other European countries, and then Russia started to turn off the top. So what Germany has done, they are phasing out nuclear, they are turning off the top from the gas from Russia, but they are increasing their use of coal, right? And I personally, philosophically, have always thought, okay, we have a lot of fossil fuels. You have coal, you have oil and gas. Can we not explore technology that makes the processing or exploration of these fossil fuels even greener? And this is where the gasification of coal comes in as well as the gasification of uh, production of uh, blue hydrogen from uh, a natural gas. So it is more of a political decision. I don't think it's more of an, uh, an energy decision, but every country, and this is where it's tied to security, isn't it? Because the fact that countries depend on, interdepend on one another means that for energy means they are insecure. So the UK developing and you know, putting a lot of investment in developing the nuclear is to become energy independent and retain their secu energy security of some sort. So, but it's not a global energy security, it's more of a UK energy security. So every country, even within the same European uh, bloc, France is expanding its nuclear uh, reactors, Germany is shrinking, UK is increasing. All of these nations, they are looking for their own individual energy security, but they're not looking at the Nobody cares about the global security because it's a, once these, once every nation is energy insecure, as we've seen, the cost of energy increases and it puts pressure from the people and the government. So it's it's more of both a security and uh, a political uh, decision why these countries, all within Europe, all probably signatures to the Paris uh, uh, Paris Agreement for. Uh, for climate action, they are all going different direction, and the Russia-Ukraine war has frustrated some of these diverse the diversity in decision by by these nations. So it's not really entirely about the. I'm sure once the circumstances changes, the war stops automatically. Today, Russia becomes you know back into the G20 or G7 economic bloc, and everybody is good, and they are all you know clicking the champagne glass together. Maybe the whole decision will change. The policy will change again, and I think that's what's going on here right now. I don't know if that really helps. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank. Thank you very much. We we find ourselves in very um both interesting and troubling times, but uh, there are there are lots of things that we have to look forward to. Um, and finally, Doctor Herta, I, I I know that you've been involved in a number of projects. Uh, and of course, design projects. Has there been one that you can recall had been particularly challenging for you? Uh, what was that, or what were those challenges and that you had to overcome? And how was your 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 ten step approach able to um, overcome those challenges to to result in in a successful or what would have been deemed a successful uh, design? Yeah, there, there have been, a few, there have been a, a few different examples where the projects that I usually try to approach are projects that require a systemic kind of solution. So problems that we call wicked problems that the only way to probably try to do something about them is if we take this systemic approach. and. And that requires addressing issues from for many different stakeholders within that particular system. So, for example, if we if we think about this baby box uh, project example that that I share, uh, when we arrived to the province of Kontum, there were a few a few issues that it was very difficult for us to to realize until we went there and were immersed into that particular situation. 
uh, we were working with translators and the translators were when we were, well when we were talking with the representatives for from the from the government the translators were not uh, translating exactly what the discussions were about there were a few concerns about some uh, issues they may face because of the type of work we were trying to do. And that was a big issue because if we cannot bring along all the different stakeholders within this, within this system, uh, whatever solution we may, we may be trying to, to implement will, will fail. So it was very important for, for this project and for every project to, to bring along those different many stakeholders. Um, the only way for us to, to be able to do that was to use empathy, which as I was, I was mentioning is at the, at the core of what we do in terms of product design and human-centered design. So we try to, to, to step on those members from the, from the government shoes to try to understand why they were quite reluctant to, to share information, what were their, their fears. And once we knew or understood the way they were thinking, it was, it was easier for us to just find a way a way around around those 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 situations so probably th those are the, the the biggest the biggest issues we usually we usually face with these with these big projects thank you very much and thank you so much again to all three of you for your time for your very informative, very insightful presentations. And thank you to all of the presenters that have joined us over the course of these three days, these past three days. It really has been a pleasure to, to listen to you all, to, to learn so much uh, about uh, the concerns, the, 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 the elements that are included in, in these various perspectives all under the theme of security. There is, there is a lot. It, it, is, it is quite timely, it is quite appropriate that the Global Security Perspectives Symposium has been held, that the Global Security Perspectives Network has been formed and launched. And I personally am also looking forward to seeing some of the, the outcomes of these collaborations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, wherever you are across the world, I really thank you for joining us over these past few days. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you. Uh, I'd like to say again, thank you on behalf of the Faculty of Science and Technology here at the Mona campus in Jamaica. It's the, the place for science and technology, the go-to place for science and technology. And so until our next event, thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of the week. And I look forward to seeing you all again very soon. So long. <laughs>